I don't need to tell you about climate change. I'm assuming that everyone here in the room has heard a little bit about what it is and what's happening to us. And I'm not sure exactly, though, if you've given enough thought, if we've all given enough thought to what we're going to do about it. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. Climate change is on our doorstep. The center picture here is my street in October of 2011, up in Salem, Massachusetts, where this is what I woke up to, a combination of the ocean filling up the storm drains, combined with a microburst that ruined at least 20 cars on my street. And it was at this point that I'd had enough. I have to admit that I had done my research and looked at the FEMA flood maps, but it was in a zone B, so I thought I was gonna be safe, and I decided to buy a condo in this neighborhood, and lo and behold, FEMA has updated their flood maps twice since then. So it's, it's really here, and it's real, and it's affecting a lot of us. So in our local jurisdictions, here in Massachusetts, we're a home rule state, meaning that we have our state government and rules and regulations, but at the local level, municipalities are often at the front lines of climate change and what's happening. The first thing we generally do is to assess vulnerability. And just like in any typical risk assessment, you take the likelihood of something happening, multiply it by the severity of what will happen if that thing happens, you get a score, you do a bunch of these, you come up with an index of vulnerability. And then we would rank these based on a number of factors. Cost, how much is it going to cost? Is there available funding for it? Is there liability? And is there a connection to any other existing plans with regard to development, recreation, things like that? So basically, uh, public will is also a part of this, and that's, that's where we're going to be going from here. But first, just one other thing about the risk assessment is we, we look at our flood projections. And as I said, you can go on the FEMA website and pull up your own neighborhood and see what your flood risk is. There's both the flooding from sea level rise, which is happening because the ice sheets are melting and warm water expands, there's thermal expansion. And we're expecting three and a half to six and a half feet of sea level rise here in Boston by the end of the century. It seems like a great range, but there's uncertainty. However, every time I've checked the reports, the numbers just keep going up. In my lifetime, we've only seen about eight inches of sea level rise, but the rate is accelerating. And at a recent symposium that I led up on the Great Marsh, we discovered that by 2100, 74% of the roads around the Great Marsh, the largest salt marsh in New England, will be flooded. That's 74% of roads around 42 miles on the upper North Shore of Massachusetts. And it's not going to stop here. You know, for scale, in 2070, Boston will see about uh, 11,000 buildings at risk from a 10-year storm and 75-plus days where what we call nuisance flooding today is happening on a regular basis. So my grandchild's grandchild uh, will be experiencing sea level rise. It doesn't stop at 2100. So what are the options? Generally, there are three options that we look at. We look to accommodate, we look to protect, and we look to retreat. I'll talk about the last one in a minute. With accommodation, we make it so that if the water comes and, and interferes with our resource, it's going to be okay. It's not going to permanently damage the resource. We think about raising houses on stilts or, or putting our utilities up on higher floors. With regards to protect, that's when we don't want the water in. We put up seawalls or dunes or berms, things like that. Retreat is when we say, this is too much. It's going to cost too much. We're going to pick up and get out of dodge and move to higher ground out of harm's way. These are typically the three options we're looking at. The avoid option I mentioned there because we definitely want to avoid further building in the floodplain. However, we're not doing a fantastic job at that. There are a surprising number of ways that you can build in the floodplain today. I sit on my local conservation commission and I see this happening all the time. Oftentimes our hands are tied because our regulations are not yet at the point where we are avoiding putting things in the floodplain. So what do we think as Americans? The Yale Center for Climate Communications in 2009 published its first report on Americans' perceptions about global warming. We'll use global warming as a proxy for climate change because back then we were, we were talking a lot about global warming. Basically, there are six categories. There's the alarmed, the concerned, the cautious, and then there's the three Ds. There's disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. And without having the full definitions, maybe you might think right now where you are on that spectrum and maybe where you've been or people you know that you might have Thanksgiving dinner with and they might be somewhere other than where you are. <laughs> so here's what the data says about Americans' perceptions. Over 14 years, you can see that a little bit less than a third of Americans are in the D's category where they're not convinced or maybe even think that it's a hoax. 
And luckily, or thanks to a lot of hard work, we're moving up the ladder in terms of those that are alarmed and concerned. But we still have a ways to go. And I would like to propose to you today, we should all try to elevate ourselves on this, on this list. Quite frankly, I'm alarmed that more people aren't in the alarmed category. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you a story about this. I actually heard about this story on a podcast I was listening to while I was on vacation last summer. And it kind of ruined my vacation because I'm an environmental educator, and as such, we can't not talk about climate change. The changing climate is one of the biggest stressors of ecosystem health, um, and we're seeing invasive species and a whole lot of other factors. So Pacifica, California is a Bay Area city that, like many other cities, decided to conduct a vulnerability assessment, typically identifying funding, hiring a consultant, consultant comes in and looks at the flood models, also you know, wind and heat and all these other factors, produces a report with beautiful charts and graphs and a series of policy recommendations. And so in Pacifica they did this, and, and among the policy recommendations was what neighborhoods would be candidates for protection, accommodation, retreat. The next thing that they do, especially if you've got you know, tax dollars paying for such reports, is you have a public meeting to present the report. Well, before the public meeting happened, some people who live in one of the neighborhoods that was designated as a potential candidate for retreat read the report and freaked out. <laughs> they went to town. A flyer was circulated among all the residents. They began to protest. They went to the mayor. They complained. They lobbied hard. They even voted the mayor out of office. And eventually, they were successful. And as you can see, there was a, a, lot, of, a lot of interest in this story. They had managed retreat stricken from this report and decided it is not a today option. They took it off the table. When I heard this, my heart sank because it's already a challenge to communicate to people about climate change. It's complicated enough to understand why it's happening and what is going to be happening to us. But the question of what we're going to do about it is not just about environmental science. It's about social issues, economics, policy, law, cultural values, aesthetic, recreational values. There's really a lot going into it. And so in, th in terms of communication, I think the education community, we have an, an outsized role to play in communicating not only what's happening, but also how we as a society stand up as citizens uh, to weigh and trade off these issues uh, to make, make further decisions. So these trade-offs, you know, trade-off is when you want to do multiple things, but they can't all happen at once. Many of the trade-offs will be financial. We're deciding right now whether we're going to build the seawalls or whether or not we should try to make nature-based solutions. But ultimately, if the sea is rising, I would ask, you know, are we, are we thinking enough about managed retreat? Are we thinking about getting out of harm's way? Time and money will be needed. I'm not advocating that individual property owners should bear the burden just because you happen to live um, in a coastal property. Some folks may have inherited the coastal property, and it's not just wealthy people who live in harm's way. In fact, some of our most vulnerable communities live in harm's way because they were on the other end. They were in the muddy, swampy neighborhood that was then landfilled and turned into an industrial zone, and that's certainly the case in parts of Boston. So should we spend now on what is inevitably going to flood? The flooding is not going to stop. The sea is rising. Should we cut our losses? So some of the decisions that we're facing are already happening in town meeting, in city council meetings. We're already voting on some of these things. Perhaps we're voting on whether or not to fix the seawall and build the school another time. Perhaps we're voting on whether or not to expand our stormwater system to accommodate more rain and that public health initiative will wait till another day. Yes, we can apply for funding from uh, private and from government entities, but these decisions are already in front of us. This is not a tomorrow issue. The planners are planning, the scientists are sciencing, the engineers are designing, and we are here. What can we do to prevent Pacifica from happening in our community if that seems outrageous to us? We're gonna have a lot of individual decisions to make as well such as, what legacy will we leave? My grandchild's grandchild is still going to be experiencing the sea level rise. Do I want to pass on the problems of today and have that next generation literally have to be wrenching buildings and structures out of the flood zone when they're already dealing with continued sea level rise? What example will we set and policies will we enact to leave the future generations with a livable planet? And we aren't alone. So if we think that someone's going to come and save us, every coastal community on Earth pretty much is dealing with this and facing with it, whether it's in a developed area, an undeveloped area, 
in rural areas and urban areas. And certainly there are parts of the country where managed retreat has come to the forefront uh, a lot quicker than here because of they're flatter and there's more, more in line of vulnerability, places like Louisiana. Are we paying attention to the signals around us of change? They're there, the data is there, the maps are there, the flood maps are there, the dollar signs are there. I talked about that situation in Boston where by 2070, a 10-year storm would impact 11,000 buildings. It's $1.39 billion from that one storm. I did the math, that's about 3,000 houses we might buy out, uh, you know, or, or more depending on the cost. So if we compound that, you know, what are we spending today and, and how much is it really gonna cost us in the future? I don't have the math, I hope some economists are working on this, but it's, it's, it's definitely something to look at. So here in New England, unfortunately, like Pacifica, we are really f tend to be focusing more on protecting and accommodating. As you see from these headlines, there's not a whole lot out there yet about managed retreat, but I did hear recently somebody say that the communities outside I-495, just outside of Boston, may be the landing place for our local climate change refugees. Just imagine that. So does the conversation focus too much on where and how we can accommodate? and not on should we accommodate? So my question for you is where are you headed? Where are you on the spectrum? Do you aspire to go higher? Your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, that uncle from Thanksgiving dinner? Are you going to allow yourself to be caught by surprise? Or are you going to seek out this information, this data, these signals, and educate yourself to then get involved? You can go to the FEMA website and plug in any address in America and it will give you the vulnerability but I also promise you that if you go home tonight and look on your municipal website, you will find the climate change reports, the recommendations, the next steps. This is happening across Massachusetts right now and across the country. The information is there, so educate yourself about what those risks are. What options, is there, are there things that we should be taking off the table or do we wanna leave everything on the table for now? Do your homework and don't be caught unaware. The second thing is to support. If you can't get out there, you don't have the technical skills to do it, can you support others who are doing it? Can you financially support organizations who are doing this work, who are doing the research, the economics, the engineering, the science, and I would wager to say, the most importantly, the education and communication to get the average person up to speed on what's happening. You can also volunteer. There are lots of opportunities for uh, folks such as at Mass Audubon to get involved in programs to do legislative outreach where we're looking at priorities in our own state government about how regulations can be improved to be more pro-nature. So we also need to be preparing tomorrow's homeowners, tomorrow's engineers, tomorrow's scientists, in case, just in case we don't get it fully right. So I, I would also say that educators need to be in this conversation. So if you are an educator or you know any educators, encourage them to get familiar with our local statistics. Things can be quite hyper-local, even within the city of Boston. There are priority areas. It's not gonna be a one-size-fits-all approach. And then finally, talk. This is perhaps the most important thing we can do, is talk casually over a walk or over, over coffee or over a dinner and not just in intellectual settings where we're waxing about what may happen. Talk to each other. And um, one of my favorite organizational psychologists, Adam Grant, um, posits that one of the best ways to approach a complex topic is to think like a scientist. He suggests do not preach and put others down for their beliefs. Do not politic as if there's some other motive in the conversation, and do not prosecute others because they have a different perspective than you. Think like a scientist, which involves making observations, asking questions, doing some homework, doing some research, looking for those signals, testing your theories, then revising your initial question, coming up with new questions, and discussing them with others. Especially be okay with the fact that there might not be an answer to the question yet. Be okay with the uncertainty, but if we're not talking about it, where are we going? So I would also say please bring your social capital to the table. What you know and who you know and the networks that you can bring to advance these conversations. In closing, I would just like to ask, are you ready? Are you ready to do your homework? I am.